1921. An unknown World War I American soldier was buried, buried in the Arlington National Cemetery. If you've never been to the Arlington National Cemetery, it's a site in, on a hillside that overlooks the Potomac River in Washington, D.C. And that place it has now become the focal point of what we call today the celebration of Veterans Day on the 11th of, of November. It didn't always start as Veterans Day because it started out as National or Armistice Day in a celebration of the signing of troops at the conclusion of the First World War on November 11, 1918. The 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month. It was intended for it to become a symbol of something never to be repeated. <laughs> Only two years after the fact, the Great War, or the Second Great War, took place. In it, in a battle where 16 and a half million Americans took part. 407,000 American soldiers were lost. 292,000 of which died in battle. But it wasn't until 1958 that two more American unidentified soldiers were brought from overseas and buried next to the tomb of the unknown soldier, for which every day, or excuse me, yes, every day there is a changing of the guards taking place. If you have never witnessed this in person, Google it. It is a jaw-dropping very solemn scene. There are even those who have tried to disturb that ceremony of which they have seen a sliver of the wrath of the guardians of those tombs. Yesterday was Veterans Day. I had the privilege of meeting two World War II veterans, one of which was 99 years old, and the other one was 97, and he didn't look a day older than 70. All of his mental faculties and physical abilities were intact. He joked that at various things, which was very interesting to hear somebody. And when, I mean, I approached him, I was, I was one of the speakers for a, a Veterans Day service, Appreciation Day, in, um, I can't even remember the name of the place now. It'll come back to me later. I'm too young to that, yeah. But anyway, as I'm st standing over this crowd of veterans, I started noticing one thing in common. They were very proud of the hat that they wore. Some had Vietnam vets. The majority of them did. As, as if you look back at history, you can think of... Uh, the proximity to our time period in which the Vietnam War and, uh, took place. I even met a Vietnam prisoner of war who was in prison for six months. It was a humbling experience, to say the least. But they all wore that hat very proudly. The Bible says that pride goes before the fall, right? However, I have never met a, an arrogant veteran. 
they're very proud of their service. They're very proud of, of what, what they have brought to the table. And as I scanned the, the scene, most of these gentlemen are in the twilight of their years. Yet they were very excited about our nation. Because their act of selflessness and, and, and service is one of which, now please do not misunderstand me, is what the Bible talks about. A love for service, for something that is greater than themselves, not to bring attention to themselves, but because they love those who are dear and close to their, their hearts. So they're willing to put their lives on the line for the freedoms that we all enjoy. And so as I sat and I, and I spoke to a few of them, I was humbled by that, that experience. And if you have an opportunity to visit a place like I did yesterday, I would encourage you to do so. Because it is very rare that you, are, you get to encounter from firsthand experience their experiences of what, what it was like. And as I'm driving back home, you know, the hour and a half drive back home, I'm thinking about the amount of things each of those individuals had gone through. The atrocities they had witnessed. And, and listening to uh, a podcast on the way back home about a, an, a, a Marine father whose son received the Medal of Honor, talking about how as a 17 to 18 year old, these guys were picking up heavy artillery for days on end. When now in training, we can, they, are, they only allow you to shoot off the three per day. And these individuals were doing that for an extensive amount of time. So to wonder and to think about the, the PTSD that they went through is humbling. And I'm sharing all of this because I know that we have veterans here in our, in our congregation. And I would like to recognize you and thank you publicly for your service. So if you are a veteran, would you stand? Thank you for your service. Thank you for your, your selfless act of, of, of sacrifice. You know, and we often, we often think of war veterans or, or military veterans, those who have seen battle firsthand. But, but military servicemen come in all forms, shapes, and sizes. It's a sacrifice nonetheless. So thank you for your service. Thank you for your dedication to protecting our freedoms and our family and loved ones. In that note, we do have a great enemy in common. And, and we do have a battlefield that we need to encounter. And we do have something that we all are exposed to that I want to bring to your attention this morning. So before I get into this, I'd like to invite you to, to bow your heads with me as we pray together. Father God, you have given us this opportunity to open your word together. And so now we also take this opportunity to ask that you open our hearts and our minds that we may hear you speak to us that your spirit will give us discernment 
and that our hearts will be humbled to heed your calling this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if you are a parent, you have most likely have heard Next slide, please. There you go. You have most likely heard one of your children say, it wasn't my fault, he made me do it. Or she made me do it. Well, if it wasn't for her, or if it wasn't for him, I would not get into trouble. For some, some of us, this is a daily occurrence, right? For some of us. But the reality of it is it does, it's not just in our household, right? It's everywhere. Yesterday, as I'm coming home from this event, I'm sitting at a traffic light. The light turns green, a green arrow to turn left, so you all know this is an interse- major intersection. And the light goes from red, green arrow to red to green light. You tracking? It's not an arrow, it's a green light. Which gives the person turning left the opportunity to turn left when it's safe to do so. So I'm, I'm, I'm standing at the red light, about four or five cars back. This car comes by, stops at the red light to turn right, and then all of a sudden the light turns green. It was not safe for them to move forward. And I see this construction truck just hauling, passing me on my left. If I was a prophet, and if I could foretell things before they happen, I would win the lottery. But I am not. But there was no way that you, you could not tell me that there wasn't an accident going to happen. Because his speed was too great in order for him to stop in that short distance. And sure enough, he barely even touched the brakes and used the car that was parked to stop him. The driver of the truck gets out, walks over in front of the driver of the car that was stopped at the light in which he hit and did this. And I'm thinking, really? (laughs) We often like to, as human beings, we do not like to assume culpability. And in every profession, if you are dealing with the potential of a lawsuit, or if you look at, 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 a, at the possibility of, some, of something coming back to bite you, you always defer to a, well, that's beyond my area of expertise. We do not like to own or take ownership of fault. Period. And hence, this statement, we pass the buck. Do you guys know where this comes from? There are, there are two, there are two uh, ideas behind this statement. One of them is back in early the wild, wild west, when the frontier was wide open and people were going west to look for a new life, they would go into saloons and they would play poker. And how you would tell whose turn it was, there was a knife that had the the handle of a buck's antler, thus the term buck knife. And so it would be passed around whoever had the buck knife, it was their turn to go. So it usually, whoever had the buck knife, they were in charge, per se, right? So, oh, wait, you're in charge. Here you go. Now it's your turn. But it also means that you don't take the responsibility when it comes your way. And we see this clearly in the Garden of Eden. So it didn't start in the wild, wild west. It started in the early beginnings of humanity. When Adam and Eve were separated. I'm not going to get into whose fault it was. 
it is very clear that when a couple are not together, bad things happen. And so they were separated, and the serpent comes and says, you will not surely die. You will be just like God. And Eve takes a, and sees that the fruit was, was appealing and it was attractive, takes the fruit, bites into it, and feels this, nothing happened. She felt empowered. Adam comes by, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the story here. So Adam comes by, and she blinks at him, and she says, here, I ate it. Nothing bad happened. You shouldn't have. Go ahead. Nothing's going to happen. But God said, I'm still here. So he eats of it. So when they start walking around, they notice that now for the very first time, the Bible says that they were naked and they were ashamed. That's another sermon topic altogether. But Jesus comes out and starts walking in the garden and starts calling them, Adam, Eve, where are you? And they were hiding. For the very first time, they're hiding from the person who created them. And so they come out and, 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 and Jesus says, what are you doing? What happened? You know, as a parent, when you ask the question, what are you doing? You start to get, uh, uh, um, uh, nothing, right? Or, or what are you watching? Nothing. What were you watching? Uh, they made me do it. They chose it. Okay, what were you watching? The question doesn't change. And Jesus' questions to Adam did not change. What happened? What have you done? Well, the woman that you created, Eve, careful, John. <laughs> Eve, what have you done? The serpent you created. And so we begin to see the origins of passing the buck. Not taking responsibility for ourselves. Now this morning I want to highlight a, a, a story, a very familiar story. And, and I will venture to say that I... Th- you know, when you preach a sermon on certain topics long enough, sometimes you may, conf- you may think that you've preached them before. I know I have preached this sermon before, but I think it, it's very pertinent to where we are today. So I invite, I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, I will, if you do not have a Bible with you and you do not have a, a cell phone with you, uh, we do have Bibles on the tables. You're welcome to follow along. That is a, the New International Translation, slightly different than what you'll see on the screen, but it's the same thing. Um, and if you feel that you just want to sit back and just observe, that's, that's fine too. I'll have the words on the screen as well. But we find the context where we, of the story right after the baptism of Jesus. And after thousands of years, God finally breaks through the heavens and he says at the very baptism, the end of, after Jesus comes out, out of the water, he, it was loud, it was clear, and it was audible understandable and he says this this is my son in whom 
I'm well pleased. I mean, can you imagine being there? Can you imagine just witnessing all of this and this this booming voice comes out like James Earl Jones-esque? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Some of us would be like, yes, Father. (laughs) Others would be like, what in the world is going on? And some of us would probably, I'm out of here. In the book, Desire of Ages, Ellen White tells us that when God made that statement, it was to affirm the decision that Jesus had made to come. Because what was about to happen next is where we find ourselves. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I have to caution you here. Sometimes the way we express things uh, in in the English language uh, doesn't really reflect the intent in the Greek. Let me just say that Jesus was not predestined for temptation. You tracking with me? It wasn't that it was written in the books for him to go and to be tempted. It wasn't part of the script of of the uh, itinerary of Jesus' life on earth to be baptized. Okay, I got to go this, I got to go do that, I got to go do this, and I got to go do that. I got to check here, check there, check there. Okay, done. That's not what Matthew is trying to say here. Okay? Okay. So Jesus is led up by the Spirit to, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. There was a gentleman who uh, decided to try a 40-day fast. This is what he looked like day three. Pretty normal looking guy, right? Three days? Hmm, I can do it. How about day 11? How about day 23? How about day 35? Here. Here's a comparison. Day 3 to day 35. Now, I, I saw he, 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 journ- he journaled his journey on, on, on YouTube and he talked about at the end that he couldn't even eat solid food. His body was so broken down, his, his, his organs were so accustomed to eating itself down that he had to start slowly with water and certain juices or or just hints of anything outside of water in order for him to be able to take nourishment back in so when when jesus said the bible says that jesus was hungry he was at his most vulnerable position physically he was weak he was tired okay now when the tempter came to him. He said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Well, Jesus' response was, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You know that this is actually a direct quote from the Old Testament. Jesus is quoting scripture to Satan. Just as in Genesis chapter 3 verse 5, what have you done? Food was at play here. Eve looked at that food and says, oh, that looks pretty good. That's not going to hurt me. It looks appealing. It looks attractive. And let's all be honest. 
Nothing looks better than food when you're hungry. The other day I walked into Costco. It was before lunchtime. Bad mistake. Because as soon as you walk in and you start going towards the back, you start seeing all the fruits and the vegetables and you start seeing the frozen food items and then you get to the other side and you have the samples, right? And you begin to to try some of those and, and you start seeing all that food and you're like, man, I'm hungry. I want this, I want that, I want that. When we are hungry, we become susceptible to temptations all forms of temptations. And it's easy for us to justify our actions. Why? Because we're hungry. Check out what what Desire of Ages says. When strength failed and the willpower weakened and faith ceased to respond in God, then those who had long, who stood long and valiantly along the right were overcome. He attacks our weak points of character. He seeks to shake our confidence in God who suffers such a condition of things to exist. We are tempted to distrust God, to question his love, Often the tempter comes to us as he came to Christ. Arraying before us our weakness and infirmities. He hopes to discourage the soul and to break our hold on God. What is it that you find, what's your weakness this morning? If you have a character flaw, What is that character flaw that is preventing you from having a true connection with God this morning? I'm not going to ask you to turn the round tables today. The questions I'm asking today are personal and for self-reflection. But if the tempter is going to use our character flaws, we all have something that we, we love, that we all have something that we struggle with, and it's going to be different from each and every one of us, But if we all decided as a church to fast for 40 days, we all will have one thing in common. We will be hungry. And we will be tempted to eat something at the end of those 40 days. But even the thing that we will be tempted to eat will be beneficial to us. We cannot eat it. Because it will cause us more harm than good. Oh, but it's okay, just a little bit. It's not going to affect us that bad. We can handle it. You sure? Don't we use the same justifications today when we're not hungry? Don't we, don't we tell ourselves and, and justify our actions based on, it's okay, I can get by with 80%, with 90 But what was it that Jesus said? Love the Lord your God with all, 100%. Anything else less of that is false worship. Because he also says you cannot serve two masters. So Jesus attacks, excuse me, Satan attacks Jesus at his weakest. And the same, warfare hasn't changed. He attacks you at your weakest. He attacks you when, when you're most vulnerable. And he attacks us using the very things that we enjoy. When, when Ellen White talks about the appetite, it's not just food. It's about everything else, our, our lusts, our desires, the things that we want. Sometimes what we want is not necessarily food, but something that God may have already told us, no. But we say, it's okay, I can do it. Check yourself. 
before you wreck yourself. So Jesus' reply, reply was, man shall not live by bread alone. You see, what was the purpose that Jesus was, why did Jesus go into the desert? Tell me. Why did Jesus go into the desert? What's the matter? Cat got your tongue? Is this too deep? Why did Jesus go into the desert? See, how many of you thought it was to be tempted? Right? We just read that. But Sam's got it right. He didn't go, you don't go, you don't, you don't fast for temptation. You fast for relationship. You go into, you seclude yourself. That's why Jesus says you, when you pray, go into a closet. You're not praying there so you can be tempted. You're praying because you can establish relationship. And going into the desert is like a big closet. There's nobody there. And so Jesus went in with, with the intention of drawing and strengthening his relationship with the Father in order for him to... to conclude his plan of salvation and so by providing himself would have been contradictory to the purpose for what he was there for it wasn't a, it wasn't that providing food would have been a sin but when our soul dependency and success for salvation is our dependency on god then when we say, well, I can do this, this will help me get closer, it almost becomes false worship. It, and it becomes a stepping stone for you not to trust God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. I always wondered how he got there. You know, it's okay for us to think about this because it's called holy imagination. How did they get there? You know, did, the temple was the highest building at that, at that time in the city of, of Jerusalem. Did nobody see them? Did, did, did nobody see Jesus flying in the air? You know, I, I'm always fascinated by this. It's just, it's my holy curiosity, if you want to call it that. But he takes him up to the temple, and he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and, I, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. To which Jesus replied, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Straight out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. If you, if you want to do a really in, in interesting Bible study, take these verses, go back and read it in their original contexts and see the, the, the scenarios and, and, and where God and how he's working, and how he's dealing with his people. And so he, he, he says all this. But one of the, the questions that is often asked of me is, Pastor, what does it mean to tempt God? See, when we, we tempt God... I have preached a sermon about a, a time when I was asking God to come through for me because there was no way I was going to make a flight. And I said, Lord, if this is your will, put me on this plane, not today, not tomorrow, not the next day. I have shared this story here before. And some, some asked me, said, well, aren't you testing God? My response is no. To test God, in the Hebrew, there, there are several words for it, but one of them is the word baham, bahan, 
generally, figuratively, to investigate, to examine, to prove, to tempt, to try in the sense of a, of a trial. Okay? But we find these, these words in the Old Testament in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. It's a very familiar verse to, 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 to Christians. Uh, and it says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that they may be food in my house. And try me on this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows. And so the word here is try me, test me. Okay, we get the word test. Also in, in Psalm chapter 139, verse 23, it says, I don't know, oh, there it is. It says, search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxi- anxieties. So we are, David is asking God to test him. You see, to test God is not in the context of in this sense, is not the same thing that Jesus is reflecting to, to, to Satan. Because to test God is to ask God to do something that is contradictory to his will. That's testing God. That's, so when we look back at the, at the case where, where Jesus is on top of the temple, and he says, go ahead, throw yourself. Where in the Bible does God ever tell somebody to kill himself where in the bible does god tell people or tell us to intentionally put ourselves in harm's way for the sake of of us proving that god exists it doesn't happen so to test god is to get god to go against his own instructions against his own will so there's nothing wrong in asking god to hey I need you to come through for me. As a matter of fact, Jesus taught us to do exactly that. Give us this day our daily. Not tomorrow's. Not two days from now. Today. It's in the present tense. A, 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 a relationship that is dependent on a constant and, and daily renewal with God. Check this one out. We should not present our petitions to God to prove whether he will fulfill his word, but because he will fulfill it. Not to prove that he loves us, but because he loves us. So when we ask God to do it, hey, do this to prove yourself to me. No, it doesn't work that way. He's already done everything he can to prove and to show you that he loves us. He's already given his son to die so that you and I could be called friends of God. That we may have eternal life. The difference between testing God and trying, I guess if you want to call it that, so when you put God to the test, you're going to try to contradict his purpose for your life, his will. But there's nothing wrong with asking him to come through. Lord, I need, you, I need this. And he may say, okay. But he may also say no. And wait is also an answer. It's not a Maybe. And so from there, Satan takes Jesus to upon an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all of these things I will give you if you will fall down and bow down and worship me. Now the word bow down is not there, but that is what the word means in in the Greek and in the Hebrew. To bow down. That was the very first series that I conducted here on worship. To bow down.
Jesus' reply to him was, Nah. Away with you, Satan. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you will serve. You know, I, I keep thinking about this encounter, the audacity. I know, I know this illustration doesn't depict how, how Satan really showed himself because he showed himself as an angel of light. And Jesus did not recognize the devil until the words, if you are, came out of his mouth. Because in Job chapter 1, we clearly see in the story there that there was a a council that was meeting somewhere in the galaxy and all the representatives from all the worlds came and Satan showed up. Key word, representatives. And so when God came to him and said, what are you doing here? He says, well, I came from the earth. See, Satan claimed to be humanity's representative and he did till this day and he used this very instance to fulfill that what he was trying to do when he said oh you you favored job you blessed him too much of course he's gonna honor you and god says do what you will don't kill him don't touch him first and he goes off and he kills his flock and he kills his family. And then he comes back and says, what do you think? So you still bless him. Okay, do what you will, but just don't kill him. And he inflicted wounds on Job. And Job still did not sin against God. Even when he was picking his wounds with sharp shards of clay, he wasn't angry with God. He was just confused. But nowhere did he take or diminish the position of authority of which God ruled in his life away from God. He always recognized God as sovereign. And Satan is trying to get entice Jesus, saying, look, the humanity is all mine. But he already knew that it wasn't his. It was always God's. It, was, it always belonged to God. But Jesus needed to say no. Jesus needed to say no. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you will serve. You know, Jesus reminds Satan who the boss is. Some I've heard a story that in the, and the devil ran with a tail between his legs and the angels ministered to him. The reality of it, though, this story highlights something, a, a, a far deeper truth. Some of us here are struggling with something that has put us in direct conflict with the will of God for our lives versus my desires and my will. The conflict, the, the temptations that, that Jesus suffered in the wilderness are about who we will trust, who we will serve ultimately. It wasn't, it wasn't that he went in there to be tempted for the sake of temptation of itself, but it was to strengthen his relationship with God. And at some point, when you practice and you practice and you practice, you don't become perfect. Practice does not make perfect. Practice gives you the ability to be able to exercise when you are tested. So many times when I was playing ball, used to play ball, our coach, he was to say, we need to do this over again. I'm like, come on. I know this play already. And he says, yes, you may know, you may know the play, 
but the people around you don't. Or you think you know the play, but what happens when, and he moved one piece of that puzzle around, it threw everybody for a loop. God has a plan for each and every one of us. God has the dreams and desires for each and every one of us. But sometimes we are just too busy focusing on what I want and what I dream versus what God wants for my life. This is the temptation that we face. This is our desert. In the moment, and, and, and if we are not focusing on our relationship and building up our relationship with God, when Satan appears, we will be just like Adam and Eve. Eh, it's okay. It's, it doesn't look bad. Nothing's going to happen to you. You're just going to take a few steps backwards. You can make that back up again. You may not. We're not given tomorrow. We're given today. We're given the option to choose whom we will serve today. So this morning, wherever you find yourself, know that Satan trembles before the weakest souls who finds refuge in that mighty name of Jesus. Amen. See, it doesn't matter which desert you may find, be finding yourself in. It doesn't matter what circumstances you're finding in. But the moment he appears and you, and you find rest and you find solace in Jesus, it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, it doesn't matter how long you've known Jesus or not known him, but if you find refuge in Jesus' name, Satan will flee from you. Do you need more of this in your life? Do you, what I mean by this is, do you need Satan to be fleeing from you? Do you need to, to, to grow your relationship with Jesus today? Do you find yourself in a position where you need to surrender certain things in your life and in order for you to be, when the test comes, you'll be able to step forward and say, I love you, Lord, because your mercies endure forever and I choose you because you died for me. See, Satan trembles and flees. But you need to do your part. We can't expect him to flee when we're not building our relationship with Jesus. To call out Jesus' name, it, you know, there's a, there's a saying in, in the military there are no atheists in foxholes. Do not allow the circumstances of your life to call out on God. Because you find, you find yourself at, a, at, at an impasse when you don't know the God who can save you. It needs to start today. It needs to start right now. So this morning, afternoon, my only ask, question to you is this. How many of you here need Jesus to strengthen you and your walk with God right now? Because... When we raise our hands, when we cry out. When Peter was walking, in my opinion, that was the first time somebody ever surfed. When he was walking on water towards Jesus, and he kept his eyes focused on him, the Bible tells us that a wave came in between both of them and the minute he lost sight of Jesus, he sank. Now, I don't know about you, but I sink in water. Some people float. I sink. I'm a Peter. 
But as soon as he sank, Jesus' hand was there because he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus was already there with his hand to raise him back up. We're all Peters in our own right. And I pray that you will take this opportunity to claim the name of Jesus, that you will... uh, Allow him to come close to your heart so Satan flees. But he doesn't flee just running. He'll flee trembling. Trembling and knowing that you are a child of God. Knowing that you are protected by heaven's best security system. And that you are guaranteed a place before the Almighty. May God bless you.